Okay, you're just you're just doing that. What time am I supposed to be done? When you're done, two o'clock. Two o'clock? Okay. What time should I shoot for? Twelve fifteen. Twelve fifteen? Okay. We'll we'll try that. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the Knights of the Round Table. <laughs> it's an honor. And just think, you're there too. These have been great sessions. Been great sessions. Brother Dave, that was masterful. That was great. Um, it's, it's amazing when you hear such wisdom from a young man. And, and I think we make a mistake by letting our kids think they need to be older to serve. The younger you start, the quicker you master. Well, you, we never really master it. But the quicker we become wise in it. Um, now, this may sound contrary. This has nothing to do with what I'm about to talk to or talk about here, but, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about the teenage years. We always use that teenage category. Oh, I need to stop right here. I tell you why I need to stop right here. I just became aware of the fact that there might be something that might distract somebody. I don't wear a pinky finger ring <laughs> because I'm trying to be fashionable trendy. or trendy. All this hand washing has eaten up my hands, and my finger got all eaten up and swollen, and so I had to move my wedding band to my small finger. That's the reason. It's just now beginning to straighten out a little bit. I can't use the hand sanitizers anymore. And so that's the reason for that. I have to have it on this hand. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thanks for clearing that up. I have to have that on my hand has to be there. And so, and so I don't want anybody to think that I'm wearing a pinky ring. I'm, that's not a pinky ring. That's, that's my life-saving device. <laughs> All right? Uh, but I think we, get, we have this mentality that the teenage years is a time for our kids just to have a, a good time and have fun and, and just, uh, just be, how can I say it? Uh, have childlike responsibilities, but adult privileges and those types of things. What happens then is they're 21, 22, 24, 25, before they begin to realize that the realities of life start to set in. In the Bible, they went from infancy to young child, child, young adult, 13 years of age. You know, once they're capable of beginning a family, adult responsibilities. And I, th I think we need to start our children earlier in the ministry Amen. so that they are wiser farther in advance. And I say that because Brother Dave's a young man, and what he, what he gave us this morning was wisdom. It was masterful. Appreciate that. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to talk about this morning, so <laughs> I'm going to say, no, <laughs> you don't want to hear that. Um. You've heard stories about COVID and what other people are doing concerning the COVID-related things. And you're the pastor of a church or the leader of your bus ministry. Uh, and it's true. Just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. I tell our folks, we're going to run. When we can't run, we'll walk. But we're going to keep moving forward. Amen. If we can't walk, we're just going to lean forward. Uh, but we're always going to be heading that direction. And so... Appreciate all the stories and all the, the helps and thoughts concerning our ministries and COVID. The purpose of this session right here is this, is I want to help you. This is not about the ministry around you, and this is not about the ministry you're involved in. This is about you. Uh, you have to keep your heart right if you're going to infect, infect and affect the folks that are around you. You have to. I used this passage of scripture or this verse a couple years ago, I believe, a graduation, uh, but I'll use this verse as, as the launching point for what I'm about to talk to you about. Proverbs chapter, chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23. Is this being live streamed? Do I need to be careful or just, just preach? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep thy heart, 
with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The fact that the word keep and diligence are in that passage of Scripture is because it has to be done on purpose, and it takes some effort because it will get away from you. That's why we must keep it with all what? Diligence. We must be vigilant, attentive, uh, aggressive in this matter uh, because uh, if the devil can't keep you from getting saved, he'll try to make you miserable as a Christian. And if you're a miserable Christian... You'll be ineffective in everything that you do. So keep your heart with what? All diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, I'm about to tell you something that I have rarely ever talked about publicly. Largely out of respect for my parents, because I, I never want to do them any harm. Uh, all of our life, married life, we function under a couple basic principles in our life's decisions. One of them is, honor thy father and thy mother, that, that, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on this earth. Uh, this is the first commandment with promise. It's the first one, a promise attached to this one. So every life's decision that we've made as a couple and with our family, we have to make sure that it honors our mother and our father. So what I'm about to tell you, I have rarely ever told anybody because I'd never want to do my mom and I never want to do my dad any harm. Amen. Right. But I'm telling you this so that you will know that the instruction that follows is well-founded in experience. My wife came from a broken home. Her father was an alcoholic, died in his 40s, lost two families because of alcoholism. I met him once. Met him once. He was a nice man. He was a very friendly man. Uh, but he battled alcohol till the day he died. My wife came from a broken home. Most folks don't know this. You're about to hear this. Brother Bill, you probably never knew this. I was not born a Setzer. I was born a Smith. When I was five years old, I watched my parents fight. I watched them fuss back and forth. I know what it's like being in bed at night and have my mom come in and unload our dresser drawers and pack up our suitcases and ask him, Mom, where are we going? Mom saying, we're going to Grandma's house. I know what it's like to be moved from school to school. By the time I was in sixth grade, I'd been in six different schools. Been there, done that. Never had any close friends in any of those schools because at any given time would be pulled out of class, empty out the desk, move off to another school, total strangers. Even in my senior year, part of the way into my senior year, empty out the locker, move to a new school, finish my senior year in a school with people I barely even knew. So I know what it's like to be in a home where you, you face adversity and uncertainty. I know what that's like. I, I will say that when my mom remarried, my stepdad is my dad. Uh, he has been my dad in every sense of the word. I am what I am today because of my mom and my dad. It wasn't until our, later on in our married life that I actually was able to reestablish a relationship with my father. He was a good man. But Ron Setzer is my dad. But I, I, I share this with you to let you know, because many of our kids that we're dealing with on the bus routes, they come from broken homes too. And many of the things we face in our life as, a, as in the ministry, the word ministry and misery are pretty close. And we have to deal with misery a lot. If there wasn't for misery, there'd be no ministry. And I think sometimes God drags us across the coals and through the fire, so we come out on the other side saying, no, I know what that's like. 
we, we not only sympathize, but we empathize with people. In churches, as a pastor, I hear Brother Reeves talk about small churches, and true, most of the churches in the United States are not mega churches. I bet you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> and I've always heard people say, well, there is no such thing as a small church. Well, yes, there is. They're not small to me. But there are smaller churches, and they have struggles. Larger churches have struggles. Every size church has its unique struggles. A larger church, pastor struggles probably a lot with the staff. I would know because I've never pastored a larger church on purpose. When we first got saved, we attended Troy Baptist Temple. Church was running probably 120 or so in attendance. I was nine years old. Uh, by the time I graduated from high school, or I, actually not, in my senior year, the church was running over 500 in attendance, had bus routes. We were part of that. So it was a, a growing church. The pastor of that church was a graduate of Tennessee Temple University, and he thought he had never pastored a church that size. But as, as, a, as a new Christian, a young Christian, we grew up in a, in a growing church. It was in Troy, Ohio. We went from there to Calvary Chapel Baptist Church in Minster, Ohio. It's an all-Catholic town. Um, I would say 99% Catholic. I say 99% because 99% of all statistics are made up on the spot. And so was that one. So, but I, I will say it was Catholic. The, the grade school, their grade school was taught by the nuns. This was a public school, and every day, all the, all the grade school students made a march over to the Catholic Church for a mass, led by the nuns. Uh, I know what it's like sitting in physics class in high school and having the physics teacher talk about the Big Bang Theory to all the others in the class, and most of them all went to that Catholic Church. I went to Calvary Chapel Baptist Church. I was a lone duck in that class. I remember what it was like having the physics teacher saying, as he came by and stood up by my desk, put his hand on my desk, he was talking about the Big Bang Theory, and then he looked at me and he says, of course, you don't believe that, do you? No, sir. The only Big Bang I know is God said, and bang, it was there. <laughs> so, um, But that church started off in a movie theater. When we moved to that church and started attending that church, it was under 100 in attendance. The teenage Sunday school class was, was behind the movie screen. One of the youth classes, or girls' classes, was down in the orchestra pit. There were classes, Sunday school classes, in the bathrooms. But by the time that church was six years old, they were running 600 in attendance. So I grew up in churches that were aggressively growing churches. I graduated from high school, and I went to Hiles Anderson College. The first year I was there, they were shooting for 35,000 in attendance. Everybody got a coffee mug. It said First Baptist Church on the outside, and on the inside, burned in the bottom of the inside, was Dr. Hiles' image. He said, so that's when you drink that abominable fluid called coffee. And you get down to the bottom of that cup of coffee, you'll see my face. Because <laughs> at that time, he was a carrot juice man. So all my life, my Christian experience, my church experience was the churches are supposed to grow phenomenally and big. I graduated from Hiles Anderson College, my wife and I moved down to Tampa, St. Petersburg area. I wasn't 30 yet, and this was just me, but I felt like I needed to be 30 years old before I pastored. Thought, well, Jesus Christ began his ministry at 30. I need to be at least 30 before I pastor. 30 and have some children. And so I taught in Christian schools for a while, Temple Heights Christian schools, uh, Westgate Christian schools, taught sixth grade. Sixth grade's a wonderful year. You don't have to try to explain to them the concept of one plus one is two. Uh, they've been taught that by a teacher already. 
And it's just before they become smart alecks. Yeah. <laughs> and before their voice starts to change, and before the girls start putting on the makeup and stuff. So it's a wonderful class to teach. Easy class to teach. Love teaching sixth grade. My first year, I had 60 sixth graders. 60. That was a great class. Um, every year, though, teaching, I get phone calls from churches asking if I'd come candidate for youth director or assistant pastor. I say, I, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I really can't right now because I'm under contract to finish out this year. But the reality was I wasn't going to pastor until I was 30. I turned 30. Guess how many phone calls I got that year? Zero. <laughs> My wife looks at me like she usually does and says, now what are we going to do? <laughs> I said, well, I guess we're just going to go start a church. Now, keep in mind, I'm used to being part of churches that grow fast and phenomenally, extraordinarily so. But when you start a church, it doesn't work like that. We knocked on doors for weeks, inviting folks to church. Heritage Baptist Church. I found the Skyway Inn, formerly the Ramadi Inn, was going to rent us the conference room for $25 a service. Let's lock that down. They set up the chairs. They wheeled in the piano. Outside the sliding glass doors was their Olympic-sized swimming pool, shallow in towards us. What a baptistry. <laughs> We're going to pack this place out. We visited. We set up chairs the night before thinking we were going to have at least 40 people based on our estimations and the people we'd visited, and uh, we just knew it. Uh, we didn't have a piano player. We had a blind man that played the accordion polka style. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Red Cross. You know, it's kind of... <laughs> It's an interesting invitation. <laughs> Stood outside waiting for those first people to pull up in their car and park. It was time for Sunday school to start. Nobody here until a car came around the corner, a gold Dodge Charger, black vinyl top, no driver but came around the corner. No driver. I looked at the fellow that was with me, Bob Sparks, and I said, is anybody driving that car? He goes, I don't think so. As it got closer, we realized it was a little gray-haired lady <laughs> driving a gold Dodge Charger. Pulled in and parked. There was two little gray-haired ladies in there, Frances Swan, and I can't remember the other lady's name. She had gotten saved under the preaching of J. Frank Norris and taught one of his Sunday school classes in Detroit. And she wanted to come to see what we were all about. That first service, we had two. A blind accordion player, my wife, our two little infant children, and a song director. And so I preached to two 80-year-old ladies. And so my opinion is this. As long as I have at least two 80-year-old ladies in the service, I'm doing good. <laughs> Another church that had lost its pastor and began to, began to diminish, I think uh, we visited there, there was 19 people altogether left in the church, and that included us four, and it included the previous pastors. What's the deal here? If the phone goes off, you owe us a pizza? Is that it? Okay. Thin crust, double cheese, pepperoni, <laughs> and banana peppers. Yeah. Now, see, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? <laughs> Squirrel? Now I'm starting to think like my wife. Usually, I, usually when, I'm, when I'm speaking, I try to, I try to stick, stick to the point, train of thought, lay things out in order. When my wife talks, it's <laughs> like fireworks all over the place. Lights up a night sky. Right now I'm feeling this business going on. Yes. Yes, just 19 of us. 
And we worked hard, and that church did not grow like I was hoping it would grow. It did not grow like I was expecting it to grow. We were not doing anything phenomenal, outstanding. Uh, we were really working hard at it. And it was just inching along and inching forward. And I will tell you something. When you're not accustomed to that, that can be disheartening. But I also had another principle. And that is this. When I come to a church, I come here to stay. If for some reason or another God does move me to another church, and my wife would vouch for me on this, I will never go to a church that's larger than the church that I'm leaving. Because I don't want the people that I'm leaving to think I'm just out shopping for a bigger church. And so I've always purposely pastored smaller churches than what we have left. I have never, I have never to this day ever known what I was going to get paid before I got to that church. It didn't matter. What mattered to me is where does God want me? And when I get there, those people have my whole heart. And so I say all that to preface what I'm about to say in regards to keeping your heart. There's an Indian, there's an old Indian proverb, and I don't even know if that's accurate. It's just that's what I heard. There's an old Indian proverb that the people will follow the strong horse. The people will follow the strong horse. And that's what you need to be for your people. That's what you need to be for your bus route. You need to be the strong horse. And for you to be strong horse, you have to keep your heart with all your diligence. And so these are just a few things that help me keep my heart. And I hope maybe it gives a handle for you to grab a hold of and say, you know what? I can do something with that. Amen. This is what helps me keep a strong heart. This is what helps me to make the effort to be the strong horse for our people. Because your people, they hear all that news out there too. Your people, they have family and friends out there that are telling them other things. Right? right? So they come to church confused. They come to church scared. They come to church not knowing really what to think or what to believe. And they're going to have to count on you. So you need to be the strong horse. Like Brother Dave said, be strong. Be strong. One, the number one thing, you can write this down, the number one thing, and I think it is the most important thing, if you're going to keep your heart, you need to have the right relationships with others. That, I think that's top of the list, right relationships. Right relationship with your immediate family, right relationship with your friends, right relationship with coworkers, neighbors, church. Uh, you, the list can go on, but the important things, you need to have the right relationships because, and this is not rocket science. This is not brain surgery. In my wife's metaphors, this is not rocket surgery. Amen. <laughs> We call those shonerisms around our house. <laughs> a bad relationship will harm you. A good relationship will help you. Brother Reeves, Brother Tyson, that's a good relationship. Brother Reeves and myself, that's a good relationship. When we talk to each other, we encourage each other. When we come out here to visit... And we see what's going on right here, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but we when we watch David and William and Hope and Jewel and their families, we are encouraged. That's a good relationship. We need to know who encourages us and who discourages us. The wrong person to have as a close friend and a buddy is that person that every time they talk to you, it's like a green fog comes out of their mouth, and you hear the horns of the ship sailing over the horizon going, ooh, this is going to be a bad one. <laughs> their spleen blew up. They got tumors on top of their head. You need to have the right relationships, and the most important relationship 
is have the right spouse. My wife helps me keep my heart strong. Because when I'm about to chuck it all, and that's, that's biblical terms, chuck it all. <laughs> when I'm about to say, that's enough. I've had it. I'm out of here. It's my wife that says, it's not so bad. And pass me on the back. You'll be all right. You're a great preacher. Wink, wink. You're a great. No, she doesn't do that winky thing. She keeps me encouraged. And I pray that I'm able to keep her encouraged. We have a great relationship. She helps me keep my heart strong. She helps me be the strong horse for our church. So that when I stand in the pulpit, even though I've had a bad spot this week, when I stand in that pulpit, I can stand in that pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Right relationships. Now, I think we ought to be friendly to everybody. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I believe that. But not everybody is going to help you. You need to know who helps you and who hurts you. Don't hang out with those that hurt you. Amen. Draw your strength from those that help you. How many have somebody that you know that's always an encouragement to you every time you talk to them? How many have somebody like that? Yeah. Keep that relationship strong because that will help you stay strong. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of the issues of life. And so relationships is number one. Number two, quick recovery quick recovery. We need to learn to have a quick recovery. We all have failings. We all, we all, we all stumble. We all have that bad day. Uh, we all know what it's like to go out there and turn that bus key. And it doesn't even have enough juice in the battery to go click, 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 click. Oh! Why? Why now? You go out and kick the tire as if that's going to charge the battery. <laughs> it's not going to charge the battery. We all have those moments. We all have that time. But we need to learn how to recover quickly from that. Right. Quick recovery. We all, have, we all have issues in our life that we're dealing with spiritually. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the yeah. truth is not in us. Now, I'm not interested in knowing what sin it is that you're battling, and I'm not about to tell you what sin it is I'm battling. But I will tell you this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Yeah. That sin alienates us from God the Father, but thankfully we have Jesus Christ and his shed blood that can restore us quick recovery. Amen. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, Amen. cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Amen. quick recovery. Amen. Restoration. Sometimes we have to recover several times a day. But we need to be able to have a quick recovery. Coming down, I say coming down here, we were down there. We came over here. We came from sunny Florida, where the weather today is 77 degrees and sunny with a slight southern breeze. The weather is always wonderful in Winter Haven. Y'all come now. came out here to Nebraska. When you fly over Nebraska in the airplane, it's, a, it's part of the activities they have on the plane. See who can spot the city. <laughs> I don't see the cities, but there's a lot of crop circles out there. <laughs> Alienation. We got up. Four o'clock in the morning to catch our flight out of Tampa. We had company come in on the weekend. It's like, no, not now. We have to get ready to go to Nebraska. We have to get up early Monday morning. We don't need company now. And they stayed overnight. We didn't get home until late Sunday night. And then we had to pack. Uh, to me, packing's not hard. I don't even need a hairbrush. 
So it's, it's not hard. We didn't get to bed till after 11 o'clock, and I just laid there wide awake till the alarm went off at 4. I don't even think the alarm went off. Shut it off. Got to get ready. Go to the airport. The morning was not turning out like we'd planned. The weekend wasn't like we planned. I was getting a little bit frustrated. I remember thinking, I haven't even had time to sit down and just really ponder on what I'm going to be preaching on. I kind of have a general idea, and I've mapped it all out, and laid out the plans, and jotted down some quick outlines, and, and thought, okay, now I, I, I just need to flesh this out, but my weekend was taken away from us. As a matter of fact, the whole week went like that. My wife kept saying, well, you can take care of that tomorrow. We'll have all day tomorrow. It didn't happen like that. So we get to the airport. We're struggling to carry our luggage in. We're standing in the line to check in our baggage. And the soup bag, which just needed to be folded up. So I grabbed the bottom of it, tried to fold it up. It slipped out of my hand. The hangers on the hoop, hoop uh, on the bag caught my belt buckle, unlatched my belt, pulled my belt off. <laughs> it wasn't completely out, but pulled my belt off. Then my pants, of course, my pants don't stay up without my belt. <laughs> Usually I wear suspenders because sometimes a belt, the tighter your cinch it, the farther down the pants go. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of... And I don't want to pull my pants up over my belly because then I look like an old person. <laughs> so... So, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to hang on to the suit bag and trying to get my belt back up and pull my pants up. People are piling up us in a line trying to get their baggage checked in. It's not a good start. But we do finally get checked in. We're headed towards the, the security. I get my driver's license out. My wife gets her driver's license out. We get our boarding passes. We go through security. On the other side of security, they have that area where you have to strip down. Take your belt off, take your shoes off, take your jacket off. Take your laptop out of the briefcase, and you're piling everything into these bins, and people are piling up around you because they want to get through the line too. Take your shoes off. Uh, so I'm pulling all that stuff out, pulling my phone out of my pocket, putting everything in bins. We go through the inspection. My wife gets caught off to the side for a pat down. Every time, because she wears a skirt. They pull her off to the side. This time, I got pulled off to the side. Not because I had a skirt on, but I got pulled off to the side. So, yes, I left my kilt at home, but I got pulled off to the side. And then the uh, TSA agent walks over to me, and he grabs me by the shoulder, and he starts feeling my shoulder. I'm thinking, what are you doing? Felt my shoulder a little bit and said, okay, you're good. I'm still puzzled by that. What did they think I had on my shoulder? <laughs> Want to feel this one too? Don't ask him that. We get on the other side of the, the inspection zone and we're gathering up all of our stuff real quick, trying to get out of the way. We go over to the side there and start putting our clothes back on. And uh, I reach in my pocket, pull out my wife's driver's license, give it to her, reach in my pocket. My driver's license gone. No, because you're not going anywhere without your driver's license, not in the airport. And so I started looking frantically through the bins, no driver's license, started looking around underneath, no driver's license, went back to the inspection area as far as I could go, no driver's license. I told the TSA agent, my license, my license are here somewhere. I lost my license. Oh, did you check underneath? Yes, I checked underneath. Did you check the bins? Yes, I checked under the bins. I'm getting irritated. Because I know I've gone through security, we can get to North Platte, but we are not getting back home without my driver's license. We went off to the side and we tore everything apart, trying to find those driver's license. And I said to my wife, I said, that's it. I'm going home. I'm a homebody anyways. I'd rather be home than anywhere else anyhow. I'm going home. This bunch of nonsense. 
the TSA agents, TSA agents were too interested in helping me find my driver's license. They give me a little slip of paper, say, hey, call this if you need some help. I need help, that's why I'm here. <laughs> give me a little slip of paper. I said, that's it, I'm going home. In the meantime, my wife said, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. And then one of the TSA agents did come up and say, I thought she said, sir, why are you standing here? Because I was right in the midst of it all, and I'd been stirring up quite a bit of interest because I was going place to place looking under things. They probably, they probably caught me on security thinking, what is that guy doing? <laughs> There's that bald guy with his pants falling down. What is he doing? <laughs> no shoes on. My wife kept saying, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And that TSA agent said, what is your name? I said, well, I lost my license. No, she said, what is your name? I said, Michael Setzer. She says, is this your license? I said, yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was just not a good moment. But thankfully, I had my wife that helped me have a quick recovery. Amen. And that's when your spouse says something to you spiritual. You're the spiritual leader. You're the spiritual dynamo. You're the strong horse. But it's your wife that pats you on the back and says, it'll be all right. Evidently, the devil doesn't want you to get there. <laughs> God's going to do something. <laughs> quick recovery, though. We need to learn to have quick recoveries. And you know what helps us out with our quick, quick recoveries? The right relationships. Amen. Quick recovery. Number three. It's the last, last one. You need to have some spiritual responsibilities. You need to have some responsibilities, and I need to have responsibilities in, in such a fashion that I know there's other people that are counting on me spiritually. Those bus kids count on me spiritually. The people in our church count on me spiritually. And I'm not saying I always rise to the standard, but I'm always very aware that when they come to church on Sunday, they want to see a pastor in the pulpit who knows that God is God and yes. is all that he says he Amen. is. Amen. His word is true. Amen. That's what they need, and that's what they need to see in me. Right. Now, I will tell you this. There are times I've gone to the pulpit, and I've not felt real well. I don't know there's maybe one Sunday in my entire life that I ever missed being in the pulpit on Sunday morning, and that was only because I could not stand up. It's the only time, because no matter how I feel at this moment, I know that there are people that are coming to church this day that are expecting to hear God's word from God's man, yeah. and it's my responsibility to make that happen. And I cannot walk into the pulpit and say, we're all going to die. <laughs> Jesus saves or not. How many know who Eeyore is on Winnie the Pooh? Your people don't need an Eeyore. Your people need to know they have a man of God in the pulpit. Your, people, your, your bus riders need to know that you are there to watch out for them. They need a strong horse. So you need to keep yourself encouraged. And part of that is you need to have responsibilities in such a fashion that you know no matter what the weather's like, no matter how you feel, no matter what the circumstances are around you, you're going to be there and you're watching out for them. Amen. You just need that. When this COVID thing first came up, our people were wondering, what are we going to do? So I told them. On a Sunday morning, I told them. Fortunately, let me preface this with saying this. We have a great governor. He felt like churches were essential. Amen. Unfortunately, there were a lot of pastors who didn't feel that yeah. way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when I talk about church, I'm talking about assembling together. Yeah. 
Watching on a laptop in your pajamas and making trips to the refrigerator, that's not church. You're just watching somebody else in church. And I didn't want our people to get in the habit of thinking that was the same thing as church. It's not. You need to be there, assembled together as part of the body. And so when our people wanted to know what we were going to do, this is what I told them. We're having church. They may limit us to 10 in a service, We'll just have more services. Amen. And that's exactly what we did. We, we just kept adding more services. Even still to this day, we have two Wednesday services. We have a Wednesday service at 3, and we have a Wednesday service at 7. We just kept adding services. Had a pastor from the down the street call and said, well, what are you going to do if they won't let you have more than 10? I said, we have a lot of rooms in the church. Amen. We can have services going on all over the place. I can just go from one room to another. We're going to have church. Amen. I told them, I pastored a church in Pinellas Park, Florida, during Hurricane Elena, where Elena parked 50 miles off of our coast, Sunday morning, in the midst of a hurricane, when everybody was hunkered down. I told my wife, I got to get to the church. I got to make sure everything's all right. Amen. And you know what happened when I got to church? People started showing up. And man, was I glad that they didn't find the church closed Amen. in the midst of a hurricane. So from that point on, I told my wife, we are always have a church. Church never closes. Now, we were in Ohio, First Baptist, for the first time, never heard of it in my life. We had winter storms to the point where they were declaring levels of emergency. In a level three emergency, you were not allowed to be out on the road. If you were out on the road, you got ticketed. Sunday morning, Level three, snow up to our armpits, it seemed like. I told my wife, I got to get to the church. Somebody's probably going to show up, and I don't want somebody to come to our church and try to open that door and find it locked. It's Sunday morning. So we loaded up. We got to church. We shoveled out the door. We went inside, and guess what? People showed up. And we had a guest that day, People, somebody that we knew, but we had a guest that day, and after the service, they said, we came here today because we know Pastor Mike never closes. Amen. 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 When you stand in the pulpit, the people need to know that you're a strong horse. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Number one, we have to have the right relationships. Bad relationship will harm you. A good relationship will help you. If you want to keep a strong heart, know who your good friends are. Yes, sir. You can call them. They will encourage you. Number two, have a quick restart, quick reset, because we will all have failings. We will all have failures, but we need to have a quick recovery. A just man falls seven times and what? Rises up again. Just can't. Keep him down. Amen. They couldn't keep the Lord down. Right. It's in the grave. Three days or three nights. It's a, it's a done deal. Nope, sorry. The angel rolled the stone back. And he was already gone. We need to have a quick reset. And then we need to have spiritual responsibilities that compel us to have to be there and to have to be strong. Because somebody else is counting on us. That's what's helped me. That's what's kept me going. How many think that, how many think that uh, I've had times where I just wanted to just kind of write it all off, right off in the sunset. I'm just going to go do something else. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to lay on the sand and listen to the surf and the seagulls and just enjoy the warm sun and the gentle breeze let everybody else figure it out for themselves. Now, I describe that in such detail, you should know that I've been there. Not on the beach, but I've been there in my thoughts. Only I had to snap out of it and say, can't. I can't. I just can't do that. There are people that are dependent upon me being there. They're counting on me. Because the people will always follow a strong horse. And I will close with this, this out of the book of Revelation. And every pastor here knows exactly where I'm headed. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, 
And behold, a white horse. He that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horse, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Aren't you glad? And am I glad? That we have a strong horse to follow. That's Jesus Christ. We need to be able to say to our people, you can follow me as I follow him. Keep our hearts with what? All diligence, for out of it are the issues of life.